the Lemonster United Methodist Church. It's a new day and a new week, and God's mercies are new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness. This morning we gather in Christian worship to praise God and to be recreated into the people that God has created and called us to be. We are all in need of recreating this morning. And so whatever your background is, Whatever your address is, whoever your family is, however you find yourself feeling today, you are welcome here. You are welcome if you're older or younger, richer or poorer, lighter skinned or darker skinned, whether you're healthy or sick, whether you're more conservative or more liberal, whether you're single or divorced, whether you're sitting in a wheelchair or walking with a walker, in recovery or still addicted, whether you're anxious or depressed, weary or grieving, lonely or in need of being alone, a noisy child who struggles to sit still or an exhausted adult who struggles to get moving. Were born and raised right here in Lemonster, Mass? Or if you were born and raised very far from here indeed? If you come from a Roman Catholic Christian background, of a Protestant Christian background, or another religious or spiritual background entirely, if you are absolutely sure that you believe, or if your faith comes with some doubt, Whatever your name is, whatever labels the world has given you, receive the name that God bestows upon you every day of your life. Beloved child, welcome home, beloved child. Welcome home to God. The purpose of the United Methodist Women. United Methodist Women shall be a community of women whose purpose is to know God and to experience freedom as whole persons through Jesus Christ. To develop a creative, supportive fellowship. To expand concepts of mission. Through the participation in the global ministries of the church.
pray. For courage to do justice. O oh Lord, open my eyes that I may see the needs of others. Open my ears that I may hear their cries. Open my heart so that they need not be without succor. Let me not be afraid to defend the weak because of the anger of the strong, nor afraid to defend the poor because of the anger of the rich. Show me where love and hope and faith are needed and use me to bring them to those places. And so open my eyes and my ears that I may this coming day be able to do some work of peace for thee. Amen. This is the story of Anna Howard Shaw. Today, February 14th, is her birthday. She was born in Newcastle upon Tyne in Northern England on February 14th, 1847. She was the sixth of seven children. When she was four years old, Anna Howard Shaw moved with her family to Lawrence, Massachusetts. When Anna was 12, her father moved the family to northern Michigan to live in a cabin in the wilderness. She needed to work hard to help her mother and her siblings. Anna first learned to give sermons by practicing alone in the woods behind her home. In her book, The Story of a Pioneer, she said, For some reason, I just wanted to preach to stand up on stumps and address the unresponsive trees. After the Civil War, she moved with her sister to Grand Rapids and she worked as a seamstress. There, she met Reverend Mariana Thompson, a Universalist minister. Anna attended Albion College, a Methodist school in Albion, Michigan. Anna learned to make money through preaching, a very difficult profession for a woman in her time. Anna attended Boston University in 1876 as the only woman in a class of 42 men. Anna struggled to find employment, and her cost of living was higher than her male counterparts. Anna was ordained by the Methodist Protestant Church in 1880. Anna worked closely with Susan B. Anthony at the turn of the century. Anna became the chair of the Franchise Department of the Women's Christian Temperance Union and later a president of the American Women's Suffrage Association, working for women's rights. During this time, Anna also received her medical degree, although she never served as a medical doctor. During World War I, Anna was the head of the Women's Committee of the United States Council of National Defense earning her the U.S. Army Distinguished Service Medal. She said in a speech near the end of her life that the, the only way to refute, which means the way to argue against, uh, the argument for women to have the right to vote, was to prove that women are not people. Today, the United Methodist Women celebrate the legacy of Anna Howard Shaw annually to remind us of the strength of women and the wonderful work we can do. The Anna Howard Shaw Center at the Boston University School of Theology promotes structures and practices that empower women and honor diversity through education, support, and advocacy. So here the United Methodist Women found our way out in the snow and we found someone who deserves some special mission recognition. And Charlotte here, as a junior member of the United Methodist Women by her participation in the Mission U last summer, is here to present to you your special mission recognition pin because of your leadership with the LUMC youth group in their mission with CityWalk and with our local community. So Charlotte is here to present your pin and your certificate. Congratulations. A reading from Luke, chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Jesus visits Martha and Mary. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed 
him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Reaching out to displaced women. United Methodist Women, headquartered in New York City, has global partners around the world. One of those partners in Africa is United Methodist Women Association Cameroon. According to information in July of 2020, the United Nations estimates there are more than 437,000 dis displaced people in Cameroon. This is all due to a civil war. Some of them are living in the bushes and others in neighboring countries like Nigeria. Many men stay behind to guard homes or they have joined the secessionist forces. Women and children are most affected, living in unhealthy and sometimes deadly conditions and facing challenges to assessing, to accessing medical services. Pregnant or lactating women in the region currently have no access to basic health services and are at significant risk of waterborne diseases because they are forced to drink from contaminated sources. This is leading to a high risk for maternal and infant death. Patricia and her five children and eight grandchildren fled their town. They lived on bananas, raw yams, and dry corn. They slept on mats on the ground during the rainy season. The one stream from which they could retrieve water became fouled, but they had no choice. They had to use the water. Most of these women had depended on farming for sustenance and income. They could no longer access their fields. They could not harvest or plant. The United Methodist Women Association in Cameroon embarked on a program of peace and assistance. This included distribution of some basic commodities food and non-food products, such as clothing, gas lighters, bathing and laundry soap, toothbrushes and toothpaste to some internally displaced families living in the bushes in a southwest province of Cameroon. Beatrice, the United Methodist Women President in Cameroon says, we are tired of losing our children and burying our husbands. Finding Peace in an Anxious World. United Methodist Women had heard of a recent sermon series from our church on prayer and dealing with anxiety. Would we consider writing a book on the topic? Without asking my colleagues for permission, I said, of course we would. Urban Village Church reaches a diverse population in the city of Chicago. Our four sites stretch across different neighborhoods and our locations have different needs but one universal experience of congregants is the stress of life. Pastors from all four sites meet with people and regularly counsel them through anxiety-inducing anxiety situations. When we decided to do a sermon series across all four sites on prayer practices when one feels anxious, it seemed like a unifying message. It turned out the sermons were very popular and people approached their pastors each week with comments of gratitude for spiritual coping mechanisms. I wondered how we would accomplish what seemed like the daunting task of writing a book. The book would examine the persuasive, pervasive struggle with anxiety using examples of both daily activities and complex social issues. 
we would use the serenity prayer written by Richard Nybor just before the United States entered World War II to examine a healthy spiritual approach to coping with anxiety. Neighbor wrote his prayer when the country worried about standing up to powers and principalities of evil. We would use the prayer as a guide for submitting one's anxiety to God's power and continually working to find power in God's peaceful presence. Each pastor would write a chapter on a different line of the prayer and analyze Proverbs that promote a peaceful trust in God during times of uncertainty. My colleagues agreed to my proposal, and so we began the endeavor, endeavor of working together to write a book. I served as the editor, assigning, collecting, guiding the writing. We began in 2016 for a book to be published in 2020. I'm here to tell you about how United Methodist Women helped the Navajo Nation. In the Response Magazine article written by Daryl Junes Joe, she talks about the COVID-19 crisis and how it affected the Navajo Nation. As the Navajo Nation was made even more vulnerable by the global health crisis, United Methodist Women members responded. This is an area in New Mexico, Southeast Arizona, and Southern Southeast Utah. It covers 27,000 miles and has a population of 356,000. The need was great. There were few resources. The infection rate was high. So the call went out and the United Methodist women responded. They sent PPE, food, water, sup other supplies, and money. It made a difference. In conclusion, this is what Daryl Junes Jose Jones says. The work of the United Methodist Women members to help women, children, and youth has resulted in a wonderful and exciting time for the Navajo Nation. Many who donated also sent messages of encouragement, and many of the masks were sewn by United Methodist Women units or groups, which made them even more special. Hundreds of grateful families have been touched by the donations. Aha he, which means thank you to United Methodist Women and everyone who contributed for your generosity. May you all be truly blessed and continue to walk in beauty. The story of Deborah takes place in the time of the judges, about 5,000 years ago. After Moses had died and Joshua became their leader, he led Israel into the promised land. Joshua divided the land into 12 parts, for one for each of the sons of Israel. But then Joshua died, and the Israelites forgot how to obey God. So God would give them over to their enemies. The book of Judges that's in our Bible spans about a 400 year time period and it tells how God when the, his people had decided to call back call back to him he would raise up a leader or a prophet or a judge the fourth such judge in the book of judges is Deborah let me read the story of how Deborah led Israel into battle Judges 4, 1 through 9. Again the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jobin, king of Canaan. Sisera was the commander of his army. Now Deborah was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites would come to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, son of Abimamon, from Rekadesh in Natali, and said to him, the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, 
Go, take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands, Barak said to Deborah. If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Certainly I will go with you, said Deborah. But because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours. For the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. The battle occurs and all the Canaanites are killed except for Sisera. He ran off and hides in the tent of Jael. Jael was a wife of one of the Israelites and she had made her camp her tent. She had pitched her tent very nearby. So, Jael gave Sisera a drink, which caused him to fall asleep. And while he is sleeping, she drives a tent peg through his temple, thus killing him. This fulfills Deborah, Deborah's prophecy that the honor of killing Sisera would go to a woman. Deborah is telling us that we have a voice and God is calling us to eradicate injustice. The members of United Methodist Women are speaking out and taking a stand against such things as human trafficking, domestic violence, health care, and living wage and being paid a living wage. We are called like Deborah to hear what God is saying to us. The article today is from a pastor named Lynette Cole from the Scroon Lake Community Church in New York. Um, this article is entitled Make the Church Safer for Women. Um, she identifies as born and raised as a United Methodist woman and um, communicates that clergy women are not always treated fairly. They are often stalked, mocked, appraised, judged, and demeaned, and even paid less, simply on the basis of being women. And the church is full of powerful, strong, sensitive women of God speaking the world of Christ. Yet, appearance gets top billing. And within the Book of Discipline of the United Methodist Church, it quotes, we affirm women and men to be equal in every aspect of their common life. And therefore, we urge that every effort be made to eliminate sexual stereotypes in activity and portrayal of family life in all aspects of voluntary and compensatory participation in church and society. Jesus Christ gave an example of focus on women as he first revealed himself as the Messiah to the woman at the well, and first appeared at Easter to Mary. And likewise, we are called to share the good news. And in February 2018, during the Association of the Federal Annual Conference lay leaders, they had a listening session on the role of women and how they feel about it. And United Methodist Women started with eight founders and is now hundreds of thousands of women showing support and fulfilling this purpose to be a creative, supportive community. Hi, my name is Audrey Gray. I'm speaking on behalf of my mother, Ida Gray. Uh, she was getting an article about Cindy Johnson. Cindy Johnson is a United Methodist deaconess. She ministered the my migrants at the U.S. and Mexican border. Cindy is a native of Brownsville, Texas, and became a deaconess in 2009. That summer, she started to do the daily visits to a small group of migrants who made camp under the Matamoros Bridge located between the United States and Mexico. This camp grew from a few families and individuals seeking refuge for a better life 
into a tent city of over 2,000 people at this present. Due to the coronavirus and government restriction, Cindy learned that she was no longer able to do the face-to-face -face ministry that she loved with the people at the camp, who was in need of spiritual guidance and support. Today, the Deaconess works with a team of doctors from the Global Response Management. She now collects donations, purchases supplies, help with food and clove drives, and prepare meals for the tent city. Cindy is also an advocate for the safe conditions at these camps and detention centers around Texas. She documents the horrible conditions and makes sure that the government officials are aware and are held accountable. At the present time, Cindy has plans to launch a YouTube channel and a weekly newsletter with young people with the topics like systemic racism, women issues, faith, and more can be talked openly in a safe and loving environment. Cindy Johnson is a bridge between migrants and the governments and is a beacon for the poorest of the poor, women and children. Thank you. Hope for the future. A voice is heard in Rama, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children, says Jeremiah thirty-one fifteen. Rachel weeps again in Matthew 2 after Herod's massacre of infants. We hear Rachel weep today in the face of so many injustices. But if we keep listening, God answers. Thus says the Lord, keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for there is a reward for your work. Says the Lord, they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future. Jeremiah 31, 16 through 17a. United Methodist Women members are women of action, willing to answer yes to God's call, discerning the ways we can best answer the needs of women, children, and youth, both individually and collectively. Transitioning to sustainable and just energy and ending the criminalization of communities of color are urgent needs of our time in which women faith leaders can make a difference. There is reward for our work. There is hope for our future. In 1992, Lemonster United Methodist Church began to observe Anna Howard Shaw Sunday on a date closest to her birthday, Valentine's Day. We established a distinguished speaker series. Our speaker's name can be seen on plaques just outside the sanctuary. Our United Methodist Women Local Unit has been responsible for organizing these services, and we invite speakers who have an impact on the lives of women, children, and youth in their communities and in the church. This year, we are honored to have Bishop Susan Wolf Hassinger as our speaker. Reverend Hassinger was elected a bishop in 1996 and served as our New England, New England area bishop until her retirement in 2004. In retirement, she also served Albany, New York Episcopal area. She is currently Bishop in Residence and Lecturer in Spirituality and Leadership at Boston University School of Theology. Bishop Hassinger will also be receiving a special mission recognition pin from Lemonster United Methodist Women, and a donation will be made in her honor at the Anna Howard Shaw Center at Boston University. We welcome Bishop Hassinger. I'm glad to be with you on this day. When Lita Marsh contacted me several months ago about coming to this congregation for the Anna Howard Shaw celebration, and especially with the invitation to share something about my journey into ministry as bishop, I wasn't certain how to approach this topic. However, Lita, I am very grateful for this invitation because it has provided me with the opportunity to reflect back across decades. No, you won't have to listen to all the details of 60 years of stories. I'll try to be selective. At first, this was a daunting process, but the real gift came when Lita shared the scripture for today's worship, the story in Luke's gospel of Jesus' visit to Mary and Martha's home, and the interconnected theme for this day on hospitality. So I began to look back through several journals, refreshed my memories 
of how significantly hospitality and ministry have intersected for me. But before we turn to my story, I invite us to consider the gospel stories. You heard the reading of the Lucan story uh, referred to earlier, but I'd like to begin with a reference to the passage in Luke just prior to that text, the very familiar parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus began to tell that story to a legal expert in the crowd. The legal expert had asked him, who is my neighbor? It appeared that the legal expert was trying to trap Jesus with that question. So instead of answering it directly, Jesus told a story. He began the story by stating that it was about a certain man, no name, no specific identity, no background. The man was walking down a main road, but he was attacked by thieves and left wounded and bereft by the side. The identity of this man who was attacked is ambiguous. Was he wealthy or poor? Was he on a journey to visit family or to go to work? Was he friend or foe? We don't know. And that doesn't seem to be important to this story. What is clear is that the man was a human being in need of assistance. But two others on the road passed him by, trying to stay as distant as possible from him. One was a Levite, the other a priest, both religious leaders. But Jesus did not provide any motives for why they did nothing for the injured man. What was important in the story was just that. The religious leaders did nothing. The one who provided assistance was a Samaritan, someone who would have been recognized by the inquirer and the rest of Jesus' audience as an outcast from society and from their faith tradition someone whose religious tradition differed from theirs, even though they had similar roots. The primary difference in Jesus' day was that the Samaritans focused their uh, worship on the temple at Mount Gerizim, while the Jewish people worshipped at the temple in Jerusalem. But they came from the same forefather. That story is about the hated one, the feared, the ostracized passerby who provided hospitality and assistance, even putting some healing ointment on the victim's wounds and then taking him to an inn and paying for him to stay there while he recovered. Jesus asked his inquisitor, now who acted as a neighbor to the one in need? Who provided real hospitality for him? That story is followed in Luke's gospel immediately by Jesus' experience of hospitality in the home of Mary and Martha, two sisters who were among Jesus' followers. Jesus apparently went there to have a meal, and Martha was particularly focused on providing Jesus with something to eat. Isn't that the usual method of demonstrating hospitality in our time as well? But can you imagine Martha's surprise when she was counting on her sister to help her prepare and serve the meal, and instead Mary had a different need? It would have been expected in that time for the women to serve. Mary's need was to learn that what it meant to be a disciple, to follow Jesus. Mary needed to engage Jesus in conversation, to listen to him. And as I reread these sections of Luke's gospel, I wondered if perhaps Mary and Martha had been in the crowd that had listened to Jesus telling of that Good Samaritan story. And perhaps his interpretation of the neighbor as the one of the, in need might have made Mary wonder what might it mean for her to be a follower of Jesus. Jesus apparently need seemed to be concerned about Mary Martha's worrying about providing a meal, and that was per, perhaps providing an obstacle for Martha to keep from authentic discipleship. But Jesus saw that Mary's immediate need was to understand what it meant for her to be a disciple as a woman. In a way, 
was Jesus providing hospitality for Mary to be engaged with her uh, in a crucial question of her life? Hospitality, what is it? Can it be both providing physical assistance to those in need, whether that be caring for the hungry, the sick, the wounded? We're seeing a great deal of that these pandemic days. Can it also be providing a listening ear and wisdom and guidance to a searching soul? Both types of hospitality have been part of my experience, both in learning what it means to follow Jesus, as well as hearing a call to be in various forms of ordained ministry. When that journey began in the early 1960s, I was expected to be more like Martha than Mary. Let me take you back a ways. In my early college years, uh, I was at a school founded by the former Evangelical United Brethren tradition. The college chaplain provided students with various ways of expanding their uh, faith tradition outside of the school setting. For me, a significant opportunity came the summer after my sophomore year. I was part of a work camp in Ecuador. There were students from various Christian denominations from all over the United States, including three from Puerto Rico. And in that setting, I was able to do that because the chaplain had found funds from a women's group in a nearby church, and that funding was hospitality, enabling me to go. In that summer work camp, we began by sightseeing in the capital, Quito. There we found beautifully constructed buildings, evidence of the colonialism that had pervaded that country after the Spanish had conquered. Uh, Then we traveled to various settings outside that beautiful capital to engage in work projects, primarily in the Andes Mountains. Our hosts were often missionary families who were both providing various forms of assistance to the people, education, health, uh, economic assistance. And the missionaries were also seeking to convert persons into practicing Protestant Christianity. In those various contexts, I came to see that even missionaries understand their ministry of hospitality in different ways. I'd like to share two, briefly, very two different examples. Uh, In both cases, missionary families invited our work team into their homes. In one family, the missionaries had native people working in the kitchen and serving us, but the native peoples were not permitted to join us in eating. In the other household, the missionary family helped to prepare the meal, and they, as well as native peoples, joined with us in eating. I learned from those different experiences that the one family had bought into the colonialist practices and were not treating the native people as equals while they provided excellent hospitality to our mostly white team. The other family provided hospitality that treated all persons present as equals, as valuable and worthwhile children of God. That is a lesson that was formative to me in my reflecting on the work of the church. And eventually, that was part of what led to my call to ministry. It opened my eyes, it opened my heart to see the global nature of the church. It also helped me to understand hospitality as how we receive people, as well as how we serve people, and how we pass it on. In the summer after that Ecuadorian work camp, I was asked to travel to EUB youth camps in Florida, Ohio, and Western New York State to share that experience. I was encouraged to invite young people to consider engaging in similar opportunities in their future. But the surprise came for me when I was in the Ohio camp. I was sharing with the young people, I engaged in dialogue with their counselors, And then I began to hear the Spirit of God saying to me, I am calling you to be a pastor, to share this experience, my love, my grace, my hospitality with others. What did that mean? I was an English major in college, hoping to do graduate work in 
that area. I was considering master's programs to seek out. But that fall, I was back at campus and I shared that sense of pastoral call hesitantly with my cha college chaplain. His response to that was not only hospitable conversation, much like Mary's conversation with Jesus, but he also began to pave the way with others in the annual conference. He must have said something like, there's a woman coming through here, here's the call to be a pastor. How can we help her? That also took technical assistance on his part, much like in preparing a meal, so that I could apply to and get into seminary in the pastoral track. There were other hospitable guides along the way, both listening to me as well as providing specific guidance about how to proceed with seeking ordination. The presiding bishop at that time did not believe in ordaining women. Without various persons feeding me what I needed to respond to the call, as well as listening and guiding, I would not be here today. I was ordained in 1968, the same year in which Evangelical United Brethren and Methodists joined to become United Methodist. However, though I was ordained, there was no congregation that would accept me as pastor. It was two years after ordination when I was finally appointed to a congregation. That church could no longer afford to be full-time, so I was appointed half-time before that was permitted in the discipline. While there were some skeptics about receiving a woman as pastor, I was welcomed by many, served that church for seven years. There are many stories about mutual hospitality during that time. I don't have time to go into all that this morning. And I won't go into detail on the diverse experiences of subsequent appointments to congregations and then as a district superintendent and then uh, as a staff person in the annual conference. But I will say a bit about that. In that responsibility, I consulted with pastors and congregations in such areas as conflict transformation, visioning, and strategic planning. During that time, I also worked in the areas of anti-racism training and work, learning and sharing that learning with others. And I began to understand that anti-racism work was an essential part of ministry for me and for the whole church, and that it related to hospitality. After eight years of those responsibilities, I was surprised to be elected bishop and woke up morning one morning to find I was being assigned to New England. I began that responsibility here at about nine months after this conference had been formed from the joining of a number of other annual conferences from Maine and New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and into Eastern Connecticut. In those years, I began to understand that my previous experiences, previous training, helped to meet the needs of this region and I sought to be hospitable in my leadership with leaders of the conference, as well as with pastors and laity. And along the way, I received great hospitality from many in the extensive travels that were required. About eight years into that capacity, I retired from being a bishop, and I took training in spiritual direction. And then, surprise, I was asked to return to serve as an interim bishop, presumably for two years, serving two annual conferences. But the two years became four years, and then those two conferences joined in conversations about their future with four other conferences. And out of that emerged three new conferences. That's a longer story, but it is a story about connecting the technical work with people as well as providing hospitality and pointing people to discipleship for this time. And in, it was from that context in Upper New York that I want to share a concluding illustration of call to ministry connecting with hospitality. I suspect many of you remember Hurricane Katrina, which devastated parts of Louisiana in the early 21st century. Following that devastation, a team from that 
Troy and Wyoming annual conferences area, decided to be part of a volunteer and mission project and team trying to assist with recovery from that tragedy. And so a team of conference members, laity and clergy, leadership and non-leadership, traveled to Louisiana. We in, when we got there, we first saw a bit of New Orleans and how it was recovering or not. And then we traveled several hours away from that to Dulac, Louisiana, right along the coast. And there, our work project was repairing homes and trailers. The people of Dulac were largely descended from a Huma tribe of Native Americans, indigenous peoples. Through our engagement with that community, I became aware of how the, some of the initial uh, settlers uh, in, in coming into it French and uh, from the U.S. mistreated the Huma nation of indigenous people. The Humas were not recognized by the U.S. government as a nation because their land had gas and oil, which the rich whites wanted to exploit. One of the places where our team was involved, uh, the, this Duloc community, uh, we were repairing and rebuilding trailer homes damaged by the hurricane. I can still remember meeting the homeowner, an older Huma woman. Her home required almost total rebuilding. The trailer was damaged inside and out. But I can recall looking on the face of that woman as we saw she saw her home coming closer to being livable and habitable. And in her face, I saw the face of Christ. We were seeking to make her home hospitable, inhabitable. But in response, she and the people of that community were hospitable to us as we sought to bring them habitable homes. I learned again in that setting, <clears throat> excuse me, I learned in that setting that my call to ministry is not just about leading church organizations, but also engaging in service to all who are God's children, God's people, providing hospitality and receiving hospitality. So what does all this mean to you for your listening to God's call? It's not just for persons who are in professional ministry to be called to ministry. Each of you Women, men, children, youth are called to love God, to serve others, wherever you are in your life's journey. It can be a simple matter of hospitality, listening to someone else's story, guiding them in their desire to seek and follow Jesus. It can be as complicated as giving up your relatively comfortable life in order to feed or clothe or nurture someone whose path crosses yours. In these COVID-19 days, that might be as simple as putting on your mask or getting your vaccination. It may be as complex as what our emergency workers and teachers and healthcare workers and others are doing. In other words, you, whatever your identity, may be Mary, the searching disciple, or you may be Martha, the one who provides for human needs or you may have a touch of both within you. I invite you to prayerfully consider your call from the Holy One this day and in the days and weeks and months to come. Love God, love your neighbor with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength. So be it. I was asked what stewardship meant to me. I wasn't sure of the exact definition, so I looked it up. Stewardship is the job of supervising or taking care of something, such as an organization or property. After reading this definition, I think that God wants us to be responsible for the things he has given us, one of them being money. When I was younger, I didn't contribute to the church. I don't think I realized how important it was. I now work in the church office and I see firsthand the needs of the church. This money not only helps the operations of the church, but goes towards mission work as well. I started giving to the church several years ago. I have increased my pledge twice since then. 
I don't exactly tithe, but I give what I can. Since I have begun this practice, I find my financial burdens lifting, and I am always able to fulfill my financial obligations. I don't worry about money anymore. I trust that God will see me through, and He always does. It's not my money, it's God's money that He entrusted to me. God truly does give much to those whom He trusts with more, and He asks us to give and give generously. I also give in so many more ways. I share my gifts and talents with my church family. Lemister United Methodist Church is my home. I feel the love and warmth of my church family. I feel so blessed to be part of Lemister United Methodist Church. Please join me in an attitude of prayer. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation that we may use its resources rightly in service of others and to your honor and glory, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as Christ loves us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We offer these prayers in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, our Father who art, who art in, heaven, in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come thy, thy will, will be done, done on earth as it, as it is, is in heaven. heaven. Give, us give us this day our daily, daily bread, and forgive, and forgive us, us our trespasses. trespasses. As we, As we forgive, forgive those who trespass, who trespass against us. And lead, and lead us, us not into temptation, but deliver, but deliver us from evil. For thine, For thine is the kingdom, and the, and the power, and the glory, and the glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Every Sunday when we gather in Christian worship, we receive God's gifts of forgiveness and reconciliation. And as a forgiven and reconciled people, we offer ourselves and our gifts to God. This coming Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, and our church is hosting a drive through event that is free and open to the entire community. Everyone who comes will receive an Ash Wednesday prayer box, which will include three interactive prayer exercises appropriate for both adults and children to enter into the Lenten season with intention. There will, of course, also be an opportunity for folks to receive the imposition of ashes without getting out of their cars, COVID safety style. If you would like to be a part of supporting this and other ministries, you can give through the giving information that is shown on the screen. I invite you to offer to God what you in your heart have decided to give. Won't you pray with me? Holy God, we thank you for the gift that you have given to us in such abundance. We pray that you would receive all that we offer, multiply it, and send it out into the world for the building of your kingdom. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
before us, it is blessed. Behind us, it is blessed. Below us, it is blessed. Above us, it is blessed. Around us, it is blessed as we set out with Christ. Our speech is blessed as we set out for God. With beauty before us, with beauty behind us, with beauty below us, with beauty above us, with beauty around us, we set out for a holy place. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.